This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. Our job is to spread the gospel. Our job is to, to pray for this world, to pray for leaders to be born again, and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. But our main responsibility is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not here to try to change all the governments of the world. Jesus will do that. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Welcome again to Student of the Word. This is Pastor Bob Yandian. We're going to be talking today about end times. And the great thing about end times is the fact that we are living in them today. Now, they actually started on the day of Pentecost because the Bible says it'll come to pass in the last days. The last days began on the day of Pentecost. But we're also told in the book of Timothy, in the last days, these things are going to come to pass. And Timothy was referring to the last of the last days of which you and I are in. We are living so close to the coming of Jesus Christ. Great things are happening in this earth for the church. Revival is here and it's around the world and it's erupting here in the United States. And again, great things are happening. Oh, there's lots of resistance. There always will be, but the gospel will win. And I want to point out to you something that is misunderstood in the Word of God, I think in many cases, and it's so simply laid out. Uh, Paul made a statement in discussing the end times. He said, uh, concerning those that are asleep, he said, I would not have you ignorant. The term, I would not have you ignorant, this is found in Thessalonians. He said, the term there, I would not have you ignorant, simply means this, this is not rocket science. It's simple. In other words, oftentimes we take something simple, make something complicated out of it. And end times are not designed to be complicated. It's used in another passage of scripture where Paul referring to the types and shadows of the Old Testament said, I would not have you ignorant concerning them, the cloud that followed and followed over Moses and the separation of the seas and the cloud around them. He said, I would not have you ignorant. And yet today, if there's anything that seems confusing to people, it's Old Testament types and shadows. And they say, oh man, what's all this mean? And he's simply saying there, this isn't rocket science. It's really not that hard. It's not that complicated. And so another is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And yet there's so much confusion on the spiritual gifts today. Do we have them? Do we not? Uh, do we allow them in the church service? Do we not allow them in the church service? Is speaking in tongues for today or the gift for today? Do they all die out? All of the arguments that exist over it. And Paul simply says again, this is not rocket science. This is simple. And just as Jesus took complicated things and made them simple, so it is with end times. End times are not designed to be that difficult, that hard to understand. And we're just going to take a look at a couple of things today. I want to talk about the rapture of the church and the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are two different things. And the verse I want to start with is in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Turn there with me because it's so simply laid out in this verse of Scripture. And here Paul talking to Timothy says, uh, and, and uh, in this verse of scripture, Paul said, Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. I want you to notice something. He's going to judge the living. That is those who are born again and the dead. That is those who have are not born again. This is not talking about physically dead. We'll have to be in heaven and go through this. You will have to have left the earth. So he's speaking here to those who are spiritually alive and those who are spiritually dead. God's going to judge all Christians and God's going to judge all sinners. And it simply says he will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Two different time periods. He will judge the living and the dead at his appearing. That's the rapture of the church. Jesus Christ appears, but it also goes on to say, and his kingdom, which will be seven years later at the end of the tribulation, he's going to come back. And this is called the second advent among those. It's not actually a scriptural term. It means his second coming. Advent means a coming. And so in this verse of scripture, there are two more comings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only the first one's called an appearing. Although he's coming for the church, he's really going to appear in the sky. We're told this in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that he will appear in the sky. We will rise to meet him in the air and return to heaven with him. And so will we ever be with the Lord. But at the second advent, he's literally going to come back and touch the earth and remain here. At the rapture, he comes into the atmosphere above the earth, into the air. We rise to meet him in the air. We all turn around and go to heaven with him. That's called the rapture of the church. Only believers are taken at that time. 
believers are taken off this earth and for a split second, the whole earth will be filled with unbelievers only. At that time, God will go back to the nation of Israel and he will again use Israel as he did in the Old Testament right up until the day that the day of Pentecost began. Israel was the ones who were the custodians of the word of God and the custodians of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What we often call the Great Commission. Did you know that that didn't start with the church? It was actually in the Old Testament that the purpose of Israel was to take the gospel to the world. In fact, we're told in Isaiah 52 and verse 7, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of peace. Glad tidings is simply good news. And even the New Testament in, in chapter 9 of Romans calls what they preached the gospel. They took the gospel to the world. Understand this, Israel was not to take the law to the world. You know, people often say, well, people are saved by the law of the Old Testament. Two arguments against that. If the law was given for salvation in the Old Testament, no one was saved because there's not a law given. The Bible says that by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And the sacrifices couldn't save them because it says the blood of bulls and goats cannot remove sin. All those were were teaching aids to teach about the one that could save and it was only given to one nation. Here's the problem. If the law saved, no one got saved. And number two, if the law saved, why was it only given to one nation? And they weren't to take the law to the world. They were to take the gospel to the world. What the law taught was Jesus Christ is the Savior. What the law taught was two things. Number one, by the law, the written law, you cannot keep it. That shows you're a sinner. And the second thing is the sacrifice is taught of the one who could save Jesus Christ. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And the same was true in the Old Testament. It is today. If you try to keep the law, it'll just keep pointing you to Jesus Christ. It'll simply cause tell you you're defeated. You can't do it. You're a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. This is what the purpose of the law part, the sacrifices say, but the good news is this guy can save you. His name is Jesus. So the purpose of Israel in the Old Testament, they were responsible for taking the good news to the world. In other words, the Great Commission. And they simply marched on the mountains, took it to individual nations. The, the book of Jonah, when Jonah went to Nineveh, you know what he preached? He didn't preach the law. He didn't go down the street preaching circumcision. He didn't preach keeping the Sabbath. He didn't preach the Passover, all these. No, no. He preached one thing, repent. And the Bible says they did. And from the king all the way down to the peasants in the streets, they all repented and revival hit that nation. In fact, in chapter 4, we have it that Jonah was so depressed because he didn't want them to get saved. He hated the Ninevites and he hated the Syrian people. And so he didn't want to see them get saved. And that's why he didn't want to go. He didn't run from the call. No, he ran from the fact that he knew if he preached it, they'd get saved. He didn't want them to get saved. And in chapter 4, he actually got depressed that they got saved. Sat down under a tree and a gourd grew above his head, even provided shadow for him. The grace of God was there and he just kept getting depressed. And finally, the Lord basically just chewed him out in chapter for because these people were to receive the gospel. So the gospel's always been the same. But Israel's job in the Old Testament was, first of all, they were, they were custodians of the gospel that's preaching salvation through Jesus Christ. If that's how Abraham got saved, that's how before the law, that's how David got saved during the law. It's always been by faith. And then the second thing they were responsible for was the dissemination of the Word of God. So Israel was the custodians of the gospel and of the Word of God. That all ended on the day of Pentecost because of their rejection and sending him to the cross. God changed over and now today is using the church. But Israel is still standing there. God has simply shelved them. And so when the church goes up, he goes back and they have seven more years that they're going to have to go back to what God gave them originally. And the first thing that happens when the church goes up, it says at his appearing and his kingdom, he will judge all the living and the dead. First of all is his appearing. That is the rapture of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The church goes up to be with Jesus, disappears, and for a split second, there's not a believer on the face of the earth. But God goes back to Israel, and the first thing that happens is 144,000 Jews receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes, and they immediately go into the world and begin to preach the gospel. Their converts begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only do their converts preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in the second half of the tribulation, because the pressure is so great, the first half is called the tribulation, the second 
second half is called the Great Tribulation because you think this was bad, the second half is even worse. And in that time period, God even sends angels from heaven and they begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also, two Old Testament saints come back. One is Moses, one is Elijah, and they become the two witnesses announcing the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. And in Matthew 24, you know what it says? It's something we don't preach today. I know that's going to get some people upset. It says that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached around the world. Listen, right now we are not preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. In that day, the whole emphasis will be the coming kingdom. And notice what it says here. It says he will he will uh, judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So when the church is gone, guess what the main message is going to be? They'll know exactly when the kingdom's coming. We don't know today because we don't know when the rapture is. But once the rapture occurs, the book of Revelation actually lays it out in days, the number of days until this occurs over here. And every day they know they're getting closer and they're preaching, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. But he's not coming in the rapture. He's coming to set up his kingdom on this earth and they preach the gospel of the kingdom. Today we preach the gospel of grace. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We preach the gospel of peace, but the gospel of the kingdom will not be preached until Jesus Christ has come and taken the church out of here. And we will refer back at that time, the earth will shift back to Jewish time for seven more years. And at that time, again, with the second advent, then when the second advent occurs and Jesus Christ comes back, then all this stuff that's in the earth, the evil and all this stuff will finally be banished forever. We have been sent to block the works of Satan in this earth. We've been sent to block the nations of this world. We have been sent to slow them down, but we have not been sent to destroy them. Jesus will do that. Our job is to spread the gospel. Our job is to to pray for this world, to pray for leaders to be born again, and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. But our main responsibility is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not here to try to change all the governments of the world. Jesus will do that. We're not supposed to do his job of changing all the governments of this world. He's not to do our job of preaching the gospel. We understand there is some blending together because God has called us to pray for our nation, to vote correctly and all that. But the ultimate destruction of all this stuff around us we see of Satan entering into governments all around the world will come when Jesus Christ comes back. And on that day, Satan will be cast off the earth. Fallen angels will be cast off the earth. Demons will be cast off the earth. In that day, religion will be gone. In that day, even all the sinners will be removed off the earth. And the millennial reign of Jesus Christ will begin with believers only. Some in resurrection bodies, that's us who went up at the rapture, but others in natural bodies who were saved during the time of the tribulation and will go all the way till the end. Those that endure to the end will be spared. And those that are saved during the tribulation go to the end of it and manage to live all that time will go into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ in their natural bodies, have children in this earth. And again, this will all start with the this verse of scripture that is his kingdom. So Jesus Christ will come and judge the living and the dead and his appearing, that's the rapture of the church, and his kingdom, that's the second advent. We'll talk more about this when I get back. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership or call us at 918-250-2207. Welcome back. We're glad that you're here again in this Uh, teaching that I've got on the two comings of Jesus Christ yet to come to pass. One is for the church and one is for the entire earth. One, he will appear, that's us. He will not touch the ground, but the second time he comes back, he will touch the ground. This is the one that the angels described in Acts chapter one, where they stood there and said, why do you stand here looking up? This same Jesus that has gone up will come back again in like manner. What does that mean? The same exact way he left, he will come back. And when Jesus Christ arose on that day, he was standing on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. He went straight up into the air. At this coming that we're talking about here, let's go back to that verse of scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living 
that's Christians, those that are saved, and the dead, those who rejected God, at his appearing, that's the rapture, and his kingdom, that's the second advent. What the angel was referring to was this kingdom here. This is where he will come back to the earth and touch it. In the first one mentioned here, the rapture, he just appears in the sky. We rise to meet him in the air. This second one is his kingdom of which he will establish and be here for a thousand years to begin with and after that for eternity. But what this is simply saying here is there's going to be a time when he will come at his kingdom. When he comes back in his kingdom, he will come back as that angel said there, he'll come back in like manner. Exactly as you've seen him go, he'll come back. He will come back through the air and his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. And as his feet touch the Mount of Olives, all this stuff is going to happen. Ezekiel talks about it. Zechariah talks about it. It's discussed in Matthew 24, Matthew chapter 25, that he will come back and touch on that day. His feet will touch the Mount of Olives. At the rapture, he doesn't touch the earth. At the second advent, he does. And that's here called his kingdom. At the rapture, he appears in the sky. Only believers see him. Only believers hear him. And it says back, he'll come on that day and he will come back with the trump of God the voice of the archangel, but the world will not see it you know, and hear it. You know why? Because only his sheep know his voice. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a story told that when, uh, when a shepherd, uh, that they, they may get together with other shepherds, you know, and their flocks may mingle together, but they don't get concerned about it. You know why? Because when it's time to leave, one of the shepherds stands up and makes a particular noise that only his sheep recognize. And even though the sheep are all out there eating together, when he makes that noise, a whistle or a click or whatever he makes, the moment he does it, only his sheep raise their heads. The other sheep don't even raise their heads. They just keep on eating. And those sheep make their way out and work themselves out of all the other sheep as their shepherd is leaving. They follow their shepherd. The same thing's happening. We're here in this earth right now and, and Christians are eating all over this earth right now, living all over this earth right now with unbelievers. But one day he's going to come back from heaven with the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the archangel and just his sheep will lift up their head and they'll rise to meet him in the air. Those who have died before and in this last 2,000 years of church history will rise to meet him also, that we'll all get resurrection bodies, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And then seven years after that, he's going to come back at the second advent or in his kingdom. And on that day, he will come back to the earth and touch it. He won't touch and go back up. At the rapture, he comes, gets us, and takes us to heaven. On that day, he will come and his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. The first time he comes for us, that's his appearing. The second time he'll come back with us, that's Revelation chapter 19. And we'll be coming back with him on white horses after being in heaven for seven years, going through the judgment seat of Christ. We will come back with him on that day. And this is the day of his kingdom or his second advent. He will come back on that day and that will be the day when he will come back at the battle of Armageddon and he will take care of all the ills, all the woes, and all the destruction, all the evil, all the curses that Satan has brought upon this earth. Let's go with me for just a moment to Hebrews chapter 1. And let's talk about time periods. Time periods that are in this earth right now. And uh, then we will discuss a little bit and help you understand the day we live in today. In Hebrews chapter 1, take a look at verses 1 and 2. It says, God, who at different times and in different manners spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom or through whom also he made the worlds. And the word worlds there is the word I own, which actually means ages. It's a reference to dispensations, not to the worlds or the planets or the stars or all that, although he did make those. This verse is specifically saying that what he made also was the ages. So all creation around us, but he also made time. And time is divided up into time periods called ages or dispensations. And so in Hebrews chapter 1, again, let's take a look at it. Verse 1 is discussing the Old Testament. Verse 2 is discussing the New Testament. The Old Testament is seen in verse 1, and it says in this verse, He spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. The Old Testament is primarily Jewish, although there's a lot of things in there toward Gentiles. It was primarily written toward Israel about taking the gospel to the nations and taking the word to the nations. And so it was written in time past, Old Testament, to the Jewish fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all the different ones. And it says, by the prophets. 
And it says in that verse of scripture, beginning in verse one at the beginning of it, at different time and in different manners. The Greek word for different times is polymeros. The Greek word for different manners is polytropos. And what it means is God who at different time periods and in different ways spoke unto the people through the prophets, the Jewish people through the prophets, through the fathers goes on to say in verse 2, has in these last days spoken unto us. That's Gentiles. So the old first verse, Jews, Old Testament. Second verse, Gentiles, New Testament. And it talks about the difference between it. Let's take a look at what he was saying. He said, in the Old Testament, God spoke in different dispensations in different time periods in different ways. Here's the point. In throughout all dispensations, how God approaches man has always been different. In the dispensation of innocence, when Adam and Eve were here, Jesus Christ appeared and spoke to them in the garden every day. At a certain time, how many of you would like to have Jesus Christ come to you every day at a certain time, answer all your questions, be with you for a few hours, and then go and come back tomorrow at exactly the same time, stay exactly with you, and he does this every day. Wouldn't that be heaven? That was called the Garden of Eden. But as soon as the fall occurred, we go into a different dispensation, and that is called conscience, which ended with the flood. The first one, innocence, ended with the fall of mankind. Then conscience began, which ended at the flood. And and so, during that second one, he didn't come and talk to people individually every single day, but he spoke from heaven, and he spoke in an audible voice, and angels would come, and different ones would come, and so then it came, the one after that was human government. That ended at Babel. The Tower of Babel, but human government, we have again God speaking from heaven, God speaking in audible voices and angels, but also he spoke in signs and types and wonders. And he spoke in later on in the one after that, which is promise, and that ended in Egyptian captivity, then law, of which God spoke during those time periods by different things, such as burning bushes. And that's how that Moses received the call was by the burning bush. And then the cloud by day, and then Jesus Christ appearing as the angel of the Lord. God spoke in so many different ways ways that under the law he spoke through the types and shadows, the sacrifices, the laws, all the commandments, through the priesthood, through, and in each dispensation through the prophets and also through the, uh, the uh, uh, priesthood. He spoke to the people through the priesthood. And all these ways were different ways. God has always spoken in the Old Testament and in, different, in these time periods in different ways. Come back to it again. In every dispensation, how God approaches man has been different. But how man approaches God in every dispensation has been always the same by faith. Always this information that God gives, whether it came by an angel or came by types and shadows or a burning bush or God speaking or speaking in the garden with them, all the different ways that God has spoken has always produced faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, no matter how it came. Every dispensation, God approaches man differently, but the way that man approaches God has never changed. That means salvation has never changed from Old Testament to New. It's always been by faith. The walk of faith after we become saved has always been the same. And Hebrews chapter 11 says, by faith Abel, by faith Noah, by faith Enoch, going down the different dispensations and times through Moses and, and through, and through uh, David and through Abraham and Sarah and Rahab and all the ones mentioned there, all the way down through David and the kings and prophets, all of them, the way they approached God was always the same. By faith this one, by faith this one, by faith this one. How God approached man's always been different, but how man approached God has always been the same. And now he comes to the second verse and says, in verse 2, uh, uh, that has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And the last days is one dispensation, that's the church. And the church is here, it says, whom he has spoken us by his Son, whom he's appointed heir of all things, through also he made the ages. Jesus Christ was the one who made the ages around us. Now here's the point. When Israel's time period came to an end at the cross and the day of Pentecost and the church began. Although the, the dispensation of the law was over, Jewish time has not ended. Israel still has seven more years to be fulfilled. And they were called Daniel's 70 weeks in Daniel chapter 9. And here's the way it was divided up. Seven and uh, 62 and one. 
And what those seven and 62 weeks represent, Daniel 70 weeks, is literally 483 years from the time the decree was given till the time that Jesus Christ went to the cross. And Jesus Christ went to the cross at the end of Daniel's 69th week, and then the church began. Israel still has seven more years to go. Seven more years of Jewish history is still yet to be done. And here's the point. What happened is on the day when Israel's time stopped, and it will start again on that day, Israel was under Roman control and Rome controlled Israel on that day. Then after that, Israel and Rome kind of went below the surface. Rome was still there, Israel was still there, but Jews were dispersed around the world. Roman uh, influence in the world uh, waned. And so all this has gone on and the world empire has no longer been Rome. There's been no world empire since Rome, except for the church. The church has replaced all world empires. Once the church is taken out at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ and we are gone, the earth will shift back one more time to the last seven years of Jewish history. And what's going to happen is that the time when the tribulation begins, the last seven years of Jewish history, it will literally take up where this left off back here at the day of Pentecost. Again, Israel will be under Roman control. Control. There will be a seven-year covenant drawn up between Israel and the EU. Israel and the ruling control of the world at that time under centralized government at that time, and it will last for seven more years. And during that time, all of what the church does today will be shifted back to Israel. Israel will again become the custodians of the gospel and the custodians of the word of God, and all gospel will start in Israel and go all around the world, and that will happen. And again, this is marked at the time of this separation by the rapture of the church. It's impossible for the church to be here during the time of the tribulation for one reason. The whole earth shifts back to Jewish time. The church cannot be here. It will be taken up and God will literally go back to this time period back here and the last seven years of Jewish history will be accomplished. This is called Daniel's 70th week. And during that time again, God refers back to Jerusalem. That will end. The tribulation will end with the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ by his coming, the rapture of the church and appearing, but also by his coming over here at the second advent of the Lord. That's the difference between the two. I, all this is in my book on understanding the end times. I know that you're going to be blessed by it. I will see you next time. Understanding the end times, one of the most incredible and fascinating doctrines in the Word of God, will bring us comfort for the days in which we live. The Bible says we are to encourage and exhort one another with the knowledge of Jesus returning for His saints. In understanding the end times, Pastor Bob Yandian provides a thorough and exciting study to give you more revelation of these times in which we live. Topics include the seven dispensations, the dispensation of the mystery, the rapture of the church, the judgment seat of Christ, Daniel's 70 weeks, the temple discourse, the tribulation, the second coming, the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. To order Understanding the End Times, visit bobyandian.com or call 918-250-2207. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact or call us at 918 918- 2502207 To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.